So chapter 32 is talking about the gastrointestinal, hepatobiliary, and pancreatic systems function, assessment, and therapeutic measures. Um, will somebody explain to us the digestion process? Explain digestion. Like when we chew it, and are you telling us to explain it or? Yeah, please. Like when it starts in the mouth and um, the enzymes break it down and then it goes through our esophagus. It shows the salivary glands right there. Then it goes down to the pharynx. The esophagus is right there. It's the esophageal sphincter. Um, yes. Yeah, then it continues to go down. Do somebody want to finish? Um, so after the sphincter, it goes to the stomach. Um, then the pancreas secretes the sugar and the small intestine. I'm sorry. It, it will secrete insulin to bring insulin. sugar levels down. Okay, and then it goes to the small intestine and then yeah. to the liver. Yep, so the um, food at some point is considered chine. Um, after it leaves the stomach and it goes into the small intestines, the liver begins to um, secrete, the liver begins to actually absorb the vitamins and nutrients it needs as well as poisons, that type of thing, while um, the chine food is in a small intestines. Um, the gallbladder begins to um, secrete bile. Um, we also know it stores bile, that type of thing. Um, and the chine will travel from the small intestines into the large intestines. And typically while the chine is in a small intestines, the consistency is pretty much watery. It's more of a watery consistency. And as it um, travels through the intestines to the large intestines, the consistency of the chine becomes more and more form. That's where it should become more and more um, form. Um, and while the chine is traveling through the large intestines, eventually it makes it to the rectum and it makes it to the anus where um, waste can be um, expelled. Um, and it give you all some anatomy and physiology um, the next couple pages. So if you need to sharpen up on your AMP, you definitely want to uh, review that information. And it talks about peristalsis. So a question for you all, if your patient is experiencing increased peristalsis, will that result in diarrhea or constipation? Diarrhea. It will result in diarrhea. And if your patient is experiencing decreased peristalsis, will that result in diarrhea or will it result in constipation? Constipation. constipation. It will result in constipation because we know peristalsis is that um wave-like movement. It's that wave-like movement to help pass things. Okay. And let me point something else. And it's also important, like when you look it up here, if your patients, this the abdomen. Your patient has a, um, is getting an ostomy placed or whatever. To get an ostomy placed more so at the um, upper abdominal area, chances are it will be watery. If it's um, placed in a um, small intestines, an ostomy placed in the small intestines, I told you in the small intestines, uh, the consistency of the chine or whatever, it's more of a watery texture. So if a patient had an ostomy placed in this area 
the stool will be more so watery. But the further along the large intestines the patient get, the more form the stool will be. Which patient will be more so at risk for skin breakdown? The patient who has an ostomy at the upper abdominal area or at the left lower quadrant? Upper abdominal. The upper abdominal, because if it's more of a watery consistency, that means that that bag, the patient who have an ostomy, they ostomy bag will feel constantly, that type of thing, and it risks breaking down their skin. The patient who have more so form stool, not so much. Okay. And of course, throughout the ages, we all will um, experience age-related changes throughout the, um, the ages. And some of the age-related changes is where body just began to move a um, lot slower. The human body begins to move a lot slower. And will somebody read this paragraph? Aging and the gastrointestinal, hepatobiliary, and pancreatic system. The pancreatic. Excuse me. Okay, you ready? I'm reading the age and the gastron. That part where say many changes occur. That's where I'm starting from. Yes. Many changes occur in the aging GI system. The sense of taste is less acute. The teeth have been lost. Chewing may be difficult. Periodontal disease and oral cancer increase. Secretions throughout the GA tract are reduced. Effectiveness, effective peritonitis diminishes because of the loss of muscle elasticity and slow mortality. Indigestion episodes may increase, especially with the loss of tone of the LES. Peptic ulcers are more common in the colon. Diaper, diaper, diaper may form. Hemorrhoids and constipation may be problems. Colon cancer risk also increases age. The liver and pancreas usually continue to function well into old age. Liver damage can occur from pathogens. Pathogens. I'm sorry, y'all. It's early. Pathogens. Hepatitis virus or toxins such as alcohol. Geritidical okay. issues. Gallstone formation increases. Acute pancreatitis of unknown cause is more common. And typically in this course, I don't test you about the elderly population. Never the less um, OB or a PEDS because eventually you will take those courses. Um, but you still need to understand. So it's talking about uh, medication. Metabolism, 
and with medication metabolism, why are the elderly um, at risk for medication toxicity? Why are the elderly at risk for medication toxicity? Overtaking their medications due to memory loss. That can be a, um, a reason. That's a good one. Is it because they're taking so many medications that may have interactions? That can occur too. Mm -hmm. And what about the, their, uh, the, just the changes that occurs with the body, the different changes where things are moving a lot slower. So to keep that in mind, if things are moving a lot slower, if I'm chewing this medication up in a way that the medication exit my body is via my urine and it's to a point where I ain't urine, urinating the same, I might be urinating a little less, that type of thing, where I'm pretty much holding that medication in my body. The medication is remaining in my body because my kidneys are not working like they used to work. So that increases toxicity. If we take a medicine and it's just sitting in our body, it's no way to get the medicine out of our body. It increases our risk for toxicity. So anything that go in the body, you know, uh, it gets to find some type of way out. Okay. And it talks about uh, medications. Will somebody read this paragraph, medications? Um, as the pa ask the patient about all medications, including acetaminophen, um, antacids, aspirin, non-steroidal, anti-inflammatory drugs, and laxatives. Um, NSAIDs or aspirins can cause irritation and bleeding in the GI tract. And acetaminophen can be hematoxic. Older adults may use this medication for arthritis pain control. Older adults may use laxatives regularly and become dependent on them. Teaching may be needed on normal bowel, bowel patterns and laxative use. Excuse me. So one of the things it pointed out um, as for the medications that acetaminophen, um, NSAIDs, um, antacids, aspirin, laxatives, they all can cause irritation and bleeding in the GI tract. So that's a side effect of using those medications. And typically when we know medications can cause some type of uh, GI bleed or something like that, most of those medications might require you to put some food on your stomach um, before taking the medication or making sure that you are taking the medication in an appropriate time frame. If they say this medication can be administered every four to six hours where you are administering that medication um, as prescribed or per the directions, that type of thing. And it also inform you that acetaminophen can uh, be hepatotoxic, which means it can be toxic to the um, liver. Hepato, when you hear hepato, it makes me think liver. And then it talks about clostridium uh, difficile, which is short for C. diff. And we know C. diff is a, um, an infection more so along the GI tract um, caused by antibiotic use. Um, and with that, if a patient do have C. diff, that patient needs to be placed in isolation. That patient needs to be in isolation if they have C. diff because it's a highly contagious infection. Okay. And it talks about subjective data collection for gastrointestinal, hepatobiliary, and pancreatic systems. What questions would you all, as a student nurse or a nurse, ask a patient who is complaining? of GI issues? What questions would you ask? When was your last bowel movement? Definitely. When was your last bowel movement? That matters. What color was it? Or, you know, like the consistency? 
Yep, both of those questions matter. What color was your last bowel movement? What was the consistency? Was it watery? Was it form? That type of thing. What else? I'm complaining to you. Nurse, I got, I'm just hurting. I'm just hurting along my GI tract. What else? Where's the pain? Where, where, yeah. Where's the pain? Okay. Is there anything that's triggering it? Is there anything that's on that stops the pain? Is it a certain time of the day the pain starts? That type of thing. You want to, if you're doing a GI assessment, you know you need to assess the GI tract. I want to listen to your bowel sounds. And if a patient is telling you their left lower quadrant is where the pain is located, and you have to, which will listen to the bowel sounds, that will be the last place you listen to anyway. So I'm going to say the left upper quadrant. Patient saying the left upper quadrant is what has pain. You need to actually listen to those bowel sounds, and I will listen to the left upper quadrant last. Because again, if you listen in, if a patient complaining of pain and you decide to let that be the first area you assess or touch, that patient may go straight off on you and may refuse the rest of the assessment. So that's going to be the last area we listen to. Okay. And then it's critical to know the location of your patient's pain when they are complaining, that type of thing. And part of the reason it's critical because it may be a medical emergency. So you need to know, hey, what area of your abdomen are you talking about in pain? That type of thing. And you know, when a patient's saying, hey, something wrong with my GI tract, that's really broad because we know the GI tract goes from the mouth down to the anus. You know, so are you feeling uh, pain throughout that entire area? You know, that type of thing. Well, we have to question everything as nurses. And it's a lot of pertinent information. Um, so be sure to read through the boxes. And it was a word I wanted to ask about. As I mentioned, uh, dysphagia. What is dysphagia? What is dysphagia? Difficulty breathing. Difficulty with swallowing. And if it's difficulty with swallowing, what would be the best position to put a dysphagic patient in? Fowler's. Fowler's. We want you in Fowler's position. We need to keep the head of your bed elevated because we don't want you to aspirate that type of thing. And it's important when dealing with these diets that um, as nurses, you all know chances are um, you will be a supervisor. You will supervise CNAs, PCTs, that type of thing, um, that you are educating them. If it's to a point you walk in the patient room, this patient is NPO, that water should not be at the bedside. Water should not be at this patient bedside because the patient is NPO. You have a dysphagic patient who's on a special um, diet. Um, if this patient is on thinking liquids and you walk to that patient uh, room and they have regular water on their bedside table, that's an opportunity for you to figure out who did it and to educate them. Hey, this patient cannot have uh, water with regular consistency at their bedside. This patient is dysphagic. This patient diet uh, is thick in liquids. We need to ensure that the patient is receiving a thick and liquid diet, that type of thing because it's considered a safety issue. And you all will be dealing with the state a lot once you become nurses with the state coming into the facilities, monitoring what you all are doing, that type of thing, watching behind you. Some of that stuff is state citations. They will cite the facility for different safety issues. And cultural influences, um, with the different cultural influences, how could the cultural influence affect your patient diet? Because one of the things that I can think with cultural influences, how do culture affect patient diet? Um, 
is some cultures they fasting. You know, where hey, we're not eating from this time to that time of the day. And then the patient might be a diabetic or whatever. So culture do affect diet. I mean an individual diet. Sometimes, you know, some people um uh, refuse to eat different foods because I'm watching my weight or I'm doing this, that type of thing. So our culture can affect what we eat, how we eat, that type of thing. And it's talking about height, weight, um, and body mass index. Um, I want to say somewhere in the book, it should have BMI, but we know um, BMI is an indicator of um, an individual health status. BMI is an indicator of an individual health status. Will somebody look up the normal range for the, BM, the BMI and tell us um, the normal range for the BMI and just go down the list of uh, what numbers will be consistent with being underweight, normal weight, um, overweight, obese, etc. It says the normal is 18.5 through 24.9 and overweight is 25.0 through 29.9 and then for obesity it says 30.0 and above. And these, those numbers are numbers you all should always uh, remember because the stuff you'll be tested on in the course um, it can pop up on NCLEX when you sit for your state board. So what BMI will be considered underweight? 18.5. No, below 18.5? Yes, below 18.5. Yeah, correct. It's a word that I'm looking for. Mm. And it, this uh, particular box that we're looking at right now, it's talking about normal physical examination findings and possible abnormal findings or cause. And with bowel sounds, bowel sounds can be absent due to ileus or obstruction. What is an ileus? What is an ileus? Somebody can look up Ilias, go to Google and look up Ilias. It's a painful obstruction of the ileum or other part of the intestine. Yeah. Um, and with an Ilias, sometimes a patient can experience a paralytic Ilias, that type of thing. It could cause... Um, you want to auscultate for it. It can cause decreased bowel sounds at that particular area. But when there is an obstruction, typically just to say, um, just make me want to go back up. So look at this picture. And of course, when you are assessing bowel sounds, where do you start to listen to bowel sounds at? When you are listening to bowel sounds, you start at the right lower quadrant. Yeah. When you are listening right to, the, to the bowel sounds, right upper quadrant. And you following the, um, you pretty much following the poop to say. You, you are following it. So you will start with the right lower quadrant, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, left side is descending, left side is descending and out. 
that type of thing. But just to say, if a patient has um, an obstruction, I'm going to say the patient have an obstruction up in here or whatever, if there's an obstruction or some type of blockage in this area, right at this area, you might feel a firm mass. You also, it may also be to the point where decreased bowel sounds are in this area. But proximal to the obstruction, proximal above the obstruction or before the obstruction, you might hear all type of uh, hyperactive bowel sounds. Why would you hear hyperactive bowel sounds proximal to the obstruction? Typically, I, I would think to hear hyperactive bowel sounds proximal to the obstruction is because it's kind of trying to work hard to like push it. It's like- Almost the, const like constipation? Huh? Like constipation? Yeah, to say, yeah. Yeah, because constipation would be some type of blockage, a blockage of um, stool or something in a specific area. But proximal to any obstruction, um, you will hear hyperactive bowel sounds. You may not hear uh, any bowel sounds where it may be absent bowel sounds at the actual obstruction site or hypoactive bowel sounds at the obstruction uh, site. And it do give you the normal uh, BMI findings. Yeah. Well, just speaking up and do give you the normal BMI findings on here. So you definitely know just with this information being in here, it's fair game to test you all on it. So you do need to know the BMI findings. Some of this information is I definitely know is repeat from uh, past courses you have already taken in the program. And just some terms that I actually want to point out to you all. Uh, percussion. Ascites, what is that? Can you repeat the word? Is that some kind of fluid? It is fluid. <clears throat> okay. It's fluid. And some of the stuff, when I'm asking questions, especially if it's a quick question, don't jump on Google and look the information up. You know, and the more that you all talk and share your thoughts, that's what's going to constantly contribute to your retention. And even if you are um, answering a question wrong, it's okay if you answer a question wrong. The whole thing is you want to try and you want to actually see, um, hey, what do I really know? Or do I or don't I know it? Or was I on the right track? So I was always one of them students, even if I was wrong, I'm still going to ask this question and I'm not going to feel embarrassed if I get it wrong. One of my instructors used to tell me, you talk too much, you just like to hear yourself talk, that type of thing. But I used to ask a lot of questions or always want to answer the questions because I want to know if what I'm thinking, if it's wrong or not. Okay. And we talked about doing assessments what is the first thing we should do when we when we do an assessment when we're about to assess a patient what should be the first thing one of the first things we do introduce ourselves introduce yourself mm -hmm. yeah what an introduction yeah 
And after the introduction, if I'm ready to um, assess the patient head, what should I do? Wash your hands. Uh, but how should I start it? I'm ready to assess this patient head, their cranium. How should I start it? Explain to the patient what you're about to do first, then wash your hands. No, oh, we're inspecting. We're inspect. looking first before touching. To inspect. Before you start your, your assessment, you need to start, begin with inspection. And why is it important to inspect? Why is it important to inspect? Just in case, like, there's, uh, you know, open sores or anything, you see it before you go in and touch it? Yeah, or masses. You don't want to cause more damage. Definitely. You want to inspect because it, it pretty much gives you an opportunity to know how you need to move. And anything that you're doing, you know, you want to start off with inspection. If it's to a point you need to transfer a patient from bed to wheelchair, no, I'm not just about to run in your room, grab your wheelchair, and just put you right in a, a wheelchair. No, I need to inspect. I need to see, hey, do you have any weakness? That type of thing. Look at this patient and see if they got a weak side because they will need more help. I want to inspect. Let me look at this room to make sure it's no clutter because if it's clutter, I need to uh, move the clutter. And even with um, doing a, a head-to-toe assessment, some type of physical assessment, like the young lady said, hey, we're going to start off with inspection. And the reason we need to start off with inspection because I know I need to palpate this patient cranium. So before I palpate this patient cranium, let me inspect and look in this individual head to make sure that there are no open areas. There are no open areas or there are no, um, the patient, um, I mean, no body fluids um, is being discharged, that type of thing. Because if so, if I see blood or body fluids or open areas, I know I need to put on gloves to protect myself. So you always want to start any inspection, I mean, any assessment with inspecting. Okay. And it also just talks about a couple things that can change a patient. Um, well, it talks about the Billy Rubin how bilirubin um, levels, when elevated, it can cause the patient's skin to turn yellow. So that's the reason why patient's skin tend to turn um, yellow. And of course, jaundice is a symptom of gallbladder disease as well as liver disease. And what about dark skinned people? Would jaundice be obvious on a dark skinned person? No. That may not um, be completely obvious on dark skin, but as far as looking at the eyes, you may actually see the yellow. Looking at the sclera, you may see the yellow. Or, hey, let me look at the palm of your hands. Let me look at the palm of your hands or your conjunctiva that's where you may actually see the yellow. Will somebody read this paragraph? Well, this uh, sentence or two, right under cultural considerations. The perianal and anal areas are inspected for color, rashes, scars, fissures, external hemorrhoids, and skin breakdown. Observe the patient's stool for evidence of bacteria, a foul smell. Um, I can't really see. Stool floats on the water surface and appears greasy, pus, blood, mucus, and color. With liver or gallstone or gallbladder disease, the stool may be pale or clay colored. If all those abnormal findings. And I tell you, bowel sounds are soft clicks 
and gurgles that are normally, that vary normally in frequency and rate. Um, and then we did talk about the stethoscope as for the diaphragm and the bell. What is the, what's the difference with the diaphragm, I mean, the diaphragm and the bell? And what are they used to um, hear? The diaphragm is larger and it's like surface level almost sounds and the bell is smaller and it goes deeper. Lower sounds. sounds. Yeah, you can hear those um, sounds better that are more so deeper within. Correct. Um, and be clear, bowel sounds can be categorized as normal bowel sounds, hyperactive bowel sounds, hypoactive bowel sounds, and absent bowel sounds. And before we deem any bowel sound absent, we need to listen to that area for about five minutes. And is it normal to have an absent bowel sound? No. no. no we need to report that to the physician. Hyperactive bowel sounds aren't normal, need to be reported to the physician, physician but you do need to do a whole um, assessment. You need to do a, work, a workup assessment to figure out exactly what's going on or to try to come up with some type of conclusion. Okay. And it talks about percussion. Um, and percussion... Uh, we did discuss that, but it's more so weird just to say you all put your hand over your stomach and you take the opposite hand, two fingers next to your thumb, and you just keep whacking over your hand. You hitting over your hand. And we will talk more about it in lab. And with percussion, percussion detects fluid, air, and masses in the abdomen. It also can identify size, and location of abdominal organs, especially the liver and the spleen. So typically we cannot percuss and uh, feel our liver and spleen, that type of thing. But typically if our liver and spleen is swollen, it can be palpated or you can actually feel it. Somebody read these first two. Uh, kind of like these two paragraphs where it start with light palpation and read the one that say deep. Light palpation of the abdomen concludes the, concludes the physical assessment. If the patient is having pain, palpate the area last. Lightly depress, lightly depress the abdomen no more than 0 0.5 to 1 inch during palpation using the finger pads. Note any muscle tension, rigidity, masses, or expressions of pain. Deep palpation of the abdomen is done only by the HCP. Rebound, HCP. Rebound tenderness is determined by pressing down on the ab abdomen a few inches and quickly release the pre releasing the pressure. If the patient feels a sharp pain during this procedure, appendicitis may be indicated. Yep, so you can expect to see a test question or a quiz question on rebound tenderness. And sometimes whenever I read books, um, and especially for testing purposes, I kind of turn everything into a test question. How could they ask me this test question? Rebound tenderness, it can be to a point of... Um, what may indicate appendicitis, that type of thing, or what is considered, because um, most of y'all questions now is turning more so into application questions. They aren't so much knowledge questions. Knowledge questions would be, what do rebound tenderness mean? That type of thing. But it's more so application questions. You the nurse, what should you do? That type of thing. Once you realize this has occurred, et cetera. So this is talking about diagnostic tests for the gastrointestinal, um, hepatobiliary, and pancreatic systems.
And then just looking at some of these terms, laboratory tests for um, gastrointestinal system, carcino, embryonic, anytime we hear carcino, it makes me think cancer. And we hear those words with OMA at the end. It makes me think cancer as well. And carcino embryonic antigen, it identifies colorectal cancer. Okay. It talks about a fecal analysis, stool for a caught blood. What do they mean? What are they talking about? Testing the stool to see if it's blood. It's blood in it. Yeah, because typically, if you have uh, bleeding in your GI tract and it's more so um, high up in your GI tract, you may not actually see blood in the patient's stool if they are bleeding because it's been mixed up and all this stuff. So to see um, that there's blood in the stool, we may have to do a GWIAC um, test. The GWIAC test, the test to see if it's blood in the patient's stool. Now for an individual who may be bleeding lower in a GI tract, you may actually see that blood. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing bright red blood, you know, come out this patient buttocks where you know somewhere close in that area that patient is bleeding. But when you are bleeding in your stomach, that type of thing, no, you're not about to see the blood all the time unless the patient has started throwing up and now they're throwing up blood, that type of thing. Okay. Mr. Williams, you said when we're um, listening for bowel signs, we start in the right lower quadrant? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it talks about um, laboratory tests for the hepatobiliary and pancreatic system, where it talks about albumin. And albumin is a protein made by the liver, which it helps keep fluid in the bloodstream. So my question is, a patient has low albumin level, would the nurse expect for the patient to be on? Um, experiencing a fluid deficit or fluid excess? Deficit. Correct. Because we know if you have high levels of albumin, it's going to help keep fluid in the bloodstream. Without the um, high levels of um, albumin, it lowers the fluid in the bloodstream. And this just talks about ammonia. And with ammonia, some patients, y'all can smell a urine where it smells like strong um, ammonia. Um, and typically with patients who have high ammonia levels, that type of thing, it can increase uh, confusion. And typically when patients have high ammonia levels, physician may order uh, a medication called lactulose. And lactulose, it, it definitely causes diarrhea. And it can kind of cause it at a um, quick um, pace or whatever, but lactulose will be ordered for an individual um, who have high ammonia levels, and it helps to bring the ammonia levels down. And it talks about AST as well as ALT are um, indicators of liver function. They are indicators of liver um, function. So it is a normal range for um, AST, that liver enzyme. And typically it uh, greatly increases when there has been some type of damage to the liver, acute hepatitis, um, viral or acute pancreatitis, can cause those things to actually increase. And pro, um, 
thriving time is one of the coagulation studies. Um, what do it mean when it's increased? What do it mean when it's increased? Is it that your blood is clotting faster? No, it's not uh, clotting fast enough. The higher a coagulation study is, the more you're at risk for bleeding out. The lower the coagulation study uh, is, the more you're at risk for clotting quick. And right here is talking about diagnostic procedures. It's talking about the barium swallow. Um, it's also talking about the barium enema. And when patients are getting um, any type of barium, where they get the barium swallow, they get the barium enema, it's telling you all right here, as long as it's permitted, we need to increase their fluids. For barium swallow, if you get barium enema, we want to encourage fluids. We need to increase your fluids. We need to increase your fluids so you can go and get that barium out of your, uh, your body. And the barium, actually, it works to, um, to give a better visual of what area, whatever area that the um, physicians need to look at. I was just talking about some other things. When you see the word scopy, where they're saying proctosigmoid scopy, what do scopy make you think? Like a procedure where you gotta use a stethoscope or something and look at? Scopy makes me think that they finna look up in something. So when I hear the word scopy, I'm thinking, okay, they about to look at something. Somehow they about to look at something, that type of thing. And the per percutaneous liver biopsy, um, what do we do biopsies for? The test for abnormal like cancer. Cancer is one reason. So a biopsy is done to test for disease. So it's not only done to test for cancer, it's also done to test for multiple diseases. But sometimes a lot of people don't want no biopsy just to just test, you know, that type of thing. Hey, let's try another test. Um, but biopsy, most of the time when the average person hear biopsy, you automatically think cancer. But a biopsy can be used to test for any uh, pathological disease. Will somebody read um, this paragraph under laboratory test? The complete blood count reveals if anemia or infection is present. Anemia may occur with GI bleeding or cancer. Electrolyte imbalances often occur with GI illness as a result of vomiting, diarrhea, malabsorption, or use of GI suction. Genetic testing can be done to identify family members at risk of developing serious conditions such as polyps associated with colon cancer. Thank you. And there's something else I wanted to point out. So right here, percutaneous liver biopsy, they say prior to the test, pre-test, um, you need to make sure the patient have a consent sign. Um, we need some labs and the lab to be a complete blood count and coagulation study. Why would a coagulation study need to occur? To 
So you can see how accurate the blood is clotting. And why is that? Why is that? We don't want them to bleed out during this procedure. There you go. We already know what a biopsy, they're about to stick a needle in you. So we need to look at your coagulation studies because uh, if you already at risk of bleeding out and we stick a needle in you, into you, we definitely know it's a possibility this patient may bleed out. So now we need to monitor this patient for bleeding. And physician may not uh, do the biopsy if your uh, lab values aren't within normal limits. And post-test following a biopsy, some of the things as a nurse you need to monitor is vital signs. because we know vital signs is an indicator of health status. We want to monitor the vital signs. We want to monitor the biopsy site. Anytime a patient get a biopsy, we want to monitor that site. And if a patient is getting a uh, biopsy, you know, you also want to critically think, is there a bodily system that could have been affected? If they had to get a, um, a biopsy of the liver or whatever, we know the liver is close to the lungs. Let's listen to the lung sounds to make sure the lungs have not been punctured. That type of thing. And it talks about a caught blood, and we know a caught blood uh, cannot be seen by the naked eye. So that's the reason why the patient may have to get a guaiac test if we suspect that the patient is bleeding um, internally. And it also talks about with doing a guaiac test, you need to be clear that false positives can occur. So a patient may be put on diet restrictions and the diet restrictions is, hey, you cannot have red meat within three days of this test. You need not to be drinking red fluids, that type of thing. Certain things, certain medications, no, you cannot take because it can give a false positive where we think and we see blood, but it's really popper Kool-Aid, you know, lining your um, GI tract, that type of thing. So there are certain things a patient cannot uh, consume if they are getting a um, guaiac test, if we are assessing or checking for a caught blood. And steerrhea um, is fat in the stool, where you actually see fat in the patient's stool. And it also inform you all. Colorectal screening beginning at age 45 into 75. Uh, include an annual guaiac based to caught blood test. And colorectal screen should occur every five years. Once they start occurring, typically in those 40s, it should be occurring every five years. So that's a colonoscopy that needs to be done at that time? A colonostomy? When you put the it's word, uh, colon ostomy, ostomy at the um, end of it. That's, ostomy is a puncture where they, okay. um, yeah, and it exposes so, the organ. So how do you pronounce it when they, um, I know you have to be a certain age for them to um, check your colon. What is that, a colonoscopy? No, a colonoscopy. Okay. Well, they about to look inside you, that scopy, they about to look inside you. They want to visualize something. And that's, that's the same age range, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it talks about the barium swallow. Um, again, some of the information. It talks about what a barium swallow. During a procedure, the patient drinks thick. Um, chalky barium, 
while standing in front of a fluoroscopic tube. X-ray films are taken in various positions and at specific intervals to visualize the outline of the organs. And it talks about even with a barium swallow, a laxity of can be ordered to help expel the barium and prevent constipation or a barium impaction. And it also talks about a barium enema. And with the barium enema, um, will somebody read this paragraph, the patient eats? The patient, the patient eats, eats the patient. residue diet for several days before the test to empty the bowel. Clear liquids only should be consumed 24 hours before the test. The patient is NPO or nothing by mouth eight hours before test. Laxatives, bowel cleansing solutions, and enemas may be administered the day before the test with... Um, with cleansing enemas the morning of the examination. Bowel preparation. Is that what it say? Bowel preparation is necessary for adequate visual visualization during the procedure. Inadequate bowel preparation may result in poor test results or test cancellation. The area around the rectum should be clean when the patient is sent for the procedure. Okay. So this term right here, um, esophageal gastroduodenoscopy. Uh, what that mean? What that word mean? Is it like the scope that they use to look at your stomach and the esophagus and stuff? What is and stuff? Because I see like four different words in there. The esophagus, the stomach, stomach. the duodenum is in the small intestines. Okay. And scopy. What that scopy mean? To look. Like to look inside. Yeah, they're about to visualize some. We want to look at this. That type of thing. It's just important to look at these terms or these words and make sure y'all are breaking them down completely, reading them exactly as they are, break this word completely down to make it all make sense. Okay. And it's something that's kind of key that they pointed. So with this particular procedure, we know that um, they are about to look at these different areas. Um, and it talks about check for swallow and gag reflex return before allowing fluids or foods. So sometimes they may um, know, hey, I need to go in the back of your throat. I need to look at this or whatever. They may give you some medication to stop uh, you from having a gag reflex. So typically our gag reflex is a protective mechanism that protects us. Where, hey, if some fluid going in the wrong area, that type of thing, I'm about to cough, I'm about to choke. So to prevent it from going in that area. Well, if your patient don't have a gag reflex, that means that that protective mechanism is now gone. So before I allow, after I do this procedure, when I know you do not no longer have a gag reflex at this time, before I allow you anything to drink, I need to check to make sure you have a gag reflex to prevent a safety issue from occurring. Okay. And it talks about a colonoscopy. 
where they looking inside the colon. Um, that should be occurring at least every 10 years. It's talking about gastric analysis. What do that mean to you all? Gastric analysis. Like analyzing the stomach contents? Definitely. Yep. That's exactly what it means. Gastric analysis. And some of this information is repeat based on things we already talked about. Percutaneous liver biopsy. Um, we talked about it, the biopsy, it can be used to check for cancer or another pathological um, disease. And with those biopsies, we know we need to be monitoring the site. We need to be getting vital signs on the patient because we know vital signs is an indicator of health. And it's talking about gastrointestinal um, intubation. What do that term mean to you all? Those terms mean to you all. When I hear that term, I think of a um, like some tubing going in your intestines. Yeah, in your stomach or intestines, mm -hmm. or stomach and intestines. Um, it talks about GI intubation is done for a variety of reasons. Will somebody read these bullet points, the reasons why uh, GI intubation occur? To remove gas and fluids from the stomach, to diagnose GI motility, and to obtain gastric secretions for analysis, to relieve and treat obstructions or bleeding within the GI tract, to provide a means for nutrition, gavit feeding, hydration, and medication when the oral route is not possible or contradicted, to promote healing after esophageal, gastric, or intestinal surgery by preventing distension of the GI tract and strain on the suture lines, to remove toxic substances, lavage that have been ingested either accidentally or intentionally, and to provide for, I'm sorry, and to provide for irrigation. All right. It also talks about um, entero nutrition. What do that mean? What is entero nutrition? Nutrition that's inside the GI tract. There you go. And what would parenteral nutrition refer to? Outside of the tract. Correct. Thank you. And typically, this patient has a um, a feeding tube inserted, an enteral feeding pump going. Uh, when this tube is initially placed, this is a nasal gastric tube. So we know nasal is in the nose. It was inserted in the nose down to the stomach, gastric, that type of thing. When this tubing is actually placed, this nasal gastric tube is actually placed, um, how do we confirm placement? X-ray. X-ray. We want to do an X-ray. And what is the concern up in here about a nostril? What's the concern with this nasal gastric tube about a nostril? You are the nurse, you're just getting a patient who has a nasal gastric tube. What do you need to know about it? The what measurement. The measurement. Hey. hey, let me, what number is this nasal gastric tube at? That's what I want to see documentation of. Oh, it's at 99. Once I go to the patient bedside, I want to look to make sure that number say 99. That's what I want to make sure it do say 99. And you know, whenever 
these feeding tubes are going, that your patient should never lie flat in the bed. The patient head should be elevated. And typically the patient shouldn't be lying flat at all until an hour after the tube feeding has been stopped. And that's to prevent aspiration. And somebody Google, what is gastric tubes? What is gastric tubes? And let's just talk about the G tube. The... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, finish. Um, uh, um, is a tube inserted through the belly that brings nutrition directly to the stomach. Is one of the ways doctors can make sure kids who have trouble eating get the fluid and calories they need. Um, yeah, a surgeon puts it in a G tube during a short procedure called a gastro, a gastro tummy. I'm saying that wrong. Mm -mm. But yes, what I got. Thank you. Um, it talks about some of the complications of having uh, an enteral tube or some type of tube feeding. Um, it could be too, a patient can experience tube irritation, um, tube obstruction, aspiration and regurgitation, and tube displacement. That's why we always have to check for placement when we are dealing with ENG tubes, PEG tubes, that type of thing. And typically the initial way to check for placement for some of those tubes will be a, um, an X-ray. And another way to check for placement is to aspirate, is to actually aspirate. And when you are using those um, ENG tubes, PEG tubes, et cetera, you should be flushing with water before you use it and flushing with water after um, you actually use it. And you all do know with the tube feeding, because looking at that picture, Tube feeding can be um, given where it just go up by gravity, where you won't use a tube feeding pump, where you um, give it by gravity or whatever, um, or it can be given by pump as this one is being given by pump. Mr. Williams, when you say gravity, you mean like what? So as if more so where you can like hang up hang it up and dump the food in and it go yeah. down like that okay definitely or connect the syringe um uh, excuse me to the tube and you're just giving it by gravity pouring it by gravity and it just go down like that or of course you can use a control pump And some of the information is being reinforced as for when food feeding um, is occurring, making sure the patient is properly positioned for the feeding. What might be a sign that your patient cannot tolerate the, uh, the feeding? What is a sign of um, intolerance? Is it throwing up? Aspiration. 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 Aspiration wouldn't be a sign of intolerance. That would be a complication. That's so it would, throwing, it would be th them throwing up? Throwing up is a sign of food intolerance. I can't tolerate this food. It's making me throw up or I'm feeling nauseated. What else? So I, oh, I'm sorry. Diarrhea? Diarrhea, right? I say diarrhea. Definitely. It's causing me some runny stool. 
Yep, those are signs of uh, food intolerance. So you do want to be uh, mindful of different signs that the patient is not able to tolerate this. And that needs to be reported. Anytime that a patient is experiencing anything abnormal, the nurse is responsible for notifying the physician. So I have a question, Mr. Williams. Okay. So I'm a CNA or whatever. And um, I was picking up at a facility um, probably like a few months back. But however, I had a patient who was an uh, older woman and she was on a feeding tool. And the nurse was telling me like, oh, she throws up sometimes. But that's normal. But just hearing you say like, you know, that's, that's you know, for she couldn't tolerate it. But to them, that was normal. I don't, I don't get it. Who's on a feet and so who's always yes. throwing up? Yeah, she throws up. They said she always just throw up. But they well, said it was normal. Well, it's not normal if you're throwing up. <laughs> Whatever. Right. No, I know that. But that's what the nurse was telling me. Like, yeah, but she I does guess. that. They say this is something she usually do, but it's not, that's not considered normal if you're throwing up. So if a patient is uh, vomiting regularly, you know, that is a concern. That's something that the nurses should be reporting to the uh, physician. You all will learn, and it's just some stuff that kind of can come off harsh or whatever, but it's not to be harsh. We have incompetent people in all walks of life. There are incompetent doctors, nurses, teachers, uh, people who fix it on your cars where they incompetent. You have incompetent people in all walks of life. And the thing that makes it even more challenging is when some people are incompetent and they clap their hands in your face and they holler and, you know, feel like they're proving a point, feeling what they saying is right where regardless of you clapping your hands and you hollering, you are still wrong. So there are incompetent people in all walks of life. And you all will recognize that um, once you all become nurses, hey, it, there are some incompetent nurses, um, but God forbid when you're dealing with incompetent people and they are educating other people and they're educating them wrong. Because some people, they go to educating other people and it's like you giving out false information. And one of the things that's funny, back when I used to be a nurse in school, um, one of these guys, because we had a med surge class, the teacher was she was quite tough but one of the guys he was like giving us some information and it was to the point like do not come giving us false information do not come putting nothing in our head if you really don't know what you're talking about because nobody wants to believe you and we sit and get something marked wrong on the test that type of thing but you have people who will give false information and everybody will end up believing it And right here talks about gastrointestinal uh, decompression. Will somebody read that paragraph? Um, G my GI decompression may be necessarily may be necessary when the stomach or small intestine becomes filled with air or fluid. Swallow air and GI secretions into the stomach and intestines and collect there. If they are not propelled through the GI tract by peristalsis, um, Accumulating air or fluid causes distension, a feeling of fullness and possibly pain in the abdomen. Gastric distension may occur after major abdominal surgery. Ambulating or turning the patient frequently can help prevent this. However, when GI decompression is necessary, an NG tube or rarely um, a nasal intestinal tube may be inserted and suction applied. Nasal intestinal tubes are more difficult and slower to place and may be uncomfortable, so they are not used often. The tube remains in place until full peristaltic activity, um, passage of flattest bowel movement, no distension, bloating, or cramps has returned. And this talks about parenteral, parenteral nutrition, which we talked about that. What is parenteral nutrition? 
nutrition outside, outside the GI tract. The GI tract. So how would I get it outside the GI tract? Like the regular IVs. There you go. Thank you. 